My father is gone. He died when he was 86 years of age. My mother didn't form to live after my father died. My mother, sir, was known in all the city in which I was born. My mother was the daughter of the eldest sister of my father. My father married a niece. What that makes me to myself, I've never been able to figure out. But she, and she died at 81 in the Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in Los Angeles, California. My brother after me, Morris, is gone. Brother after him, Harry, is gone. Very unfortunately, he committed suicide by jumping out of a building in the financial district of Chicago. Why he did it, the Lord in heaven alone knows. Because he was a millionaire, he never had any kind of trouble. The family didn't have any trouble. His two children didn't have any trouble. And to this day, we don't know why. We're just guessing. And maybe a doctor told him he was having terminal cancer something like that. I have a brother right here in Los Angeles. Pray for him. Good, moral, clean, fine. I could almost wish that he was a sinner, a criminal, or a drunkard, or something like that, so I'd have a chance to win him for Christ. But his very morality stands in his way. No, he doesn't criticize me. He comes to hear me preach quite often. Then I have a sister who lives in Portland, Oregon. Then I have a baby brother. I'm his godfather. I held him when he was circumcised. He teaches in a city college in New York. Not any one of us Christian. Now those three that I told you about were born in the United States of America. The rest of us were born in Russia. Where people get the idea that I come from rich parents, I haven't the faintest idea. My father was a carpenter and a small builder in Russia, and he was a carpenter and a small builder in America. He brought us here for the one purpose of giving us an education that we as Jews could have not gotten in Tsarist Russia. That's all. He came to America at quite a sacrifice. He came with nothing. And he had to start, well, as a matter of fact, his brother in Newark, New Jersey, had to meet him at Castle Garden, Ellis Island, immigration, and give him $50, because the United States government required that anyone who came into this country then had to have $50, so he wouldn't be a pauper. Now, what shall I tell you? about my childhood, what was just so exceptional. Some things I remember, some things I don't remember, some things I don't want to remember. For example, I told you that one of my brothers, or did I, died in Russia, his name was Mendel. He was four, five, somewhere like that. I don't suppose I remember him. I've seen too many children. But if, when we got ready to leave, the place where the cemetery is, city. We lost Mama until my grandfather took me by the hand and brought me to the cemetery. And my mother was stretched out on the grave of that baby boy, weeping her heart out. When we arrived in Chicago, before my father had a chance to say anything, to kiss her, kiss us, she threw herself on her neck and wept out, what kind of a mother am I anyway that I could leave our darling child 3,000 miles away in that cold, black Russian soil? You know why she acted that way? Because she didn't know what David knew. She didn't know what you and I know, that even though that baby brother could not come back, she could come to him. 
through proper relationship with God. Well, I came here, as soon as I learned how to talk English, they put me in the first grade, naturally. I had about the equivalent of a first-year high school in Russia. I was already studying algebra and geometry, but they put me in the first grade. I didn't know any Jew uh, English, I mean. I couldn't even do this in English. I didn't know it. They didn't teach it out there in Russia. I knew other languages, but I promise you it didn't take me long to learn. And as soon as I learned English, I began to peddle papers to help meet the expenses of the family. Then when I was 14, I got a working certificate. I think you have to be older now. And from then until now, I've been working. And I mean working. I'm not play acting. If I had my life to live over again, and knew what I know now, I wouldn't do it. People, I've never had a vacation. Never. I've never played ball. Any kind. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm for them. If I had my life to live over again, I'd play them all. I'd even take my life in my hands and go with Carl on that motorcycle, that suicide <laughs> thing that he's got, just for the thrill. But I'm busy working, working, working. I got a job with the American Oil Express and work six days a week from three in the afternoon to 11 at night. I worked my way through grade school and academy, university, and law school. I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. That was my ambition. Well, when I graduated law school, I came out to hire man. I was the valedictorian. I got Kraft Key and the summa cum laude and all the rest of it. But they gave me a scholarship, two years. I didn't want to waste it, but I wanted to start practicing law. So I practiced law during the daytime and went to school from 6 <laughs> till 9.30, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, five days a week until the other degree came along. One of my professors died, and they asked me to take his classes. I shouldn't have done it. I know now, but I'm glad I did, and you'll understand why in a minute. For such an honor, here's an undergraduate almost, and yet has to teach, not law, dear God, I couldn't teach law, didn't have enough degrees, and enough practice, but I taught, taught school, three hours on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, two hours on Tuesday and Thursday. Those of you who have ever taught in college know that it takes a lot of reading to keep ahead of your class. So I was working, working, working. Had three jobs at the same time. Practicing law, teaching in university, and then going to school at night. Until finally, I almost broke down. Not physically. I don't mean that I was so tired or something. But nervously, the strain, the terrible strain of the thing. And very unfortunately, I have to hasten on quickly. My parents did not know how to raise children. Because all of us were good in school. They were so proud of us that they pushed us. Especially me, the firstborn, instead of giving us a chance to develop properly. I came home one day, and the assistant principal of school where my son was going called me into his office. He said, we're going to make an example of Yasha. I said, how? He said, we're going to let him go as fast as he can. He's a brilliant child. I said, no, you're not. He said, he's already skipped two grades. I said, that's plenty. He's not going to skip anymore. He said, why not? I said, I want to live a natural life. I have never had it. Principal said, it'll get lazy. I said, that's exactly what I want. I want him to get lazy. I've got enough ambition for both of us. 
probably didn't get lengthy. He's done a pretty good job. He's 36. My daughter will be 35 next, the 8th of next month. Well, I started practicing law as I told you with a partner by the name of Erwin Rubel. And then I began to feel disturbed, just restless and nervous and irritable and sleepless. You can't do that. You get in trouble in a courtroom. And all of a sudden, out of a clear sky, to the praise of our Lord, we got a case. Well, not a case. Cases, clients, a moving picture, not production, but only moving picture house is concerned, retained us. And in the process of working for them, representing them, why one of us had to go here, there, and yonder across the country. So my partner and I decided that I'd go and make that a part of my uh, vacation and at the same time lose the strain of the office. I was through with school already, and as far as teaching, somebody else could take my place very easily. Now, I was an Orthodox Jew. I tried to live up to it as much as I could. I knew the Judaic religion backwards and forwards, inside out and upside down. I believed in God. I believed that there was a punishment for sin. I believed in a hereafter. I believed in a resurrection. I believed in a judgment. I believed in a heaven. And I believed in a hell. And some of you have studied psychology enough to know that the thing that was driving me in working was not so much the idea of making money. I've never been in love with money, never. Certainly not now. At any rate, it was compulsion. Like somebody takes to drink, somebody else takes to dope, somebody else takes to gambling or other things. To me, it was work, thank God. I might have become a drunkard. I might have become a junkhead. I might have become a gambler. I'm not laughing to find some sort of release. But I was too busy for all these things. But I believed not as much as I believe now, not as clearly, not as definitely, but I believed in miracles and all that that I've told you. Well, I left Chicago where we were living, where I was living, and went west to Kansas City. And then from Kansas City to St. Louis, see, I was following the chain of theaters, then back to Kansas City. I came to Kansas City the second time, real early Saturday morning. I put up in the YMCA. The reason I went to the YMCA was not because I couldn't afford to go to a hotel. I could, but uh, I wasn't feeling good. And in a hotel, the Lord knows what they do to me. The YMCA, they take care of me. Besides, I belong to the YMCA. Well, in the course of that day, in the evening, just about dark, a number of us in that YMCA lobby got into an argument, discussion, everything under the sun. We settled all the national and international problems and finally came down to, you know what, religion. What I didn't know about religion would fill <laughs> 10 Carnegie libraries. And that's just the kind of a person who can argue religion. He doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> when you come to me, I'll open my Bible and say, Thus saith the Lord. If you don't like that, I'll open it and say, Thus saith the Lord. If you don't like that, thus saith the Lord. If you don't like that, I'll kiss you on both cheeks and say, God bless you. If you won't believe the Lord, you certainly won't believe me. So I'm just going to let you go your own sweet way to hell, if that's what you want. What else can I do? I'll never argue about the Bible. I'll never argue about Jesus Christ. Except the Jews who do not know the Bible and do not know the story of Jesus. Well, we got into a discussion. They told me that white was white, I told them that white was tattletale gray, or black, or something like that. About 10 o'clock, we split up. I went to my room, I felt good. I'd straightened out a bunch of dumb doors. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, I went into my room, closed the door, took off my jacket, started unlacing my shoes. Somebody knocked on me. Come in. In walked an elderly gentleman. He'd been in that argument. And I thought there was something still he didn't know. I didn't <laughs> tell him everything I knew in one argument. He said, my name is Danny. I'm a reporter. I'm the Kansas City Star. Come in, Miss Danny, sit down. I was on the edge of the bed. He sat down in a chair. He found out I was a lawyer and a Jew. And he said, you're just like the rest of your people. You argue about something you don't know about. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to read the New Testament. I said to myself, a fellow will read the New Testament and anyway, we won't hurt you. I said, yes, sir, I'll read the New Testament, I promise. He said, I'll pray for you while you read the New Testament. Scared me to death. I thought he'd sit right there and pray for me while I read the New Testament. But he stood up, see, he stood up and stretched out his hand and said, remember, I'll be praying for you while you read the New Testament. I understood. I thanked him. He walked out. I opened the Gideon Bible on the dresser and I turned to John because I heard a missionary speaking to Jews on a street corner in Chicago say something about getting John faster. And then I read, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. There was nothing made except through it. If Gentiles want to believe that stuff, it's all right with me. But I'm a Jew. I'm too smart for that stuff. I told the man I was going to read the New Testament. I didn't tell him how much. <laughs> I read a few lines, went to bed, fell asleep. The next morning, somebody rapped on my door. I asked him to come in. The door was open. Not locked. A young man came in, works for that YMCA, sat down on the edge of the bed, said, Mr. Appleman, I got your name from the secretary. You're new here. Would you mind getting up going to Sunday school with me? I said, I'm a Jew. I don't go to Sunday school. He said, one time won't hurt you. And he looked so pitiful. I thought if I said no, he'd die. And I didn't, and I didn't want to mess up the bed. So I said, all right, I'll go to Sunday school with you. Well, we went to the Institutional Methodist Church. The reason I know these things, I live there now, Kansas City. I verified these things. Well, we finished with the Sunday school class. I could understand English and started out the same way we'd come in. Mr. Garrett was his name, pulled my sleeve. He said, Mr. Appleman, would you mind staying for church? He looked kind of sad. I didn't want to hurt him. I said to myself, you already had a slice of bacon. You've been a Christian Sunday school. You might as well have a hunk of ham and stay for, for a Christian church. So I stayed for, of course I got I didn't listen, I knew English, I could read the songs, I could understand what the choir was singing, the preacher was saying. But I left, that's all, no more church, no more Sunday school, but I wouldn't leave me alone. I thought that's all, that'd be the end of it. Every time I quiet down, this thing would keep on hammering at me. I told you I knew I was a sinner. I told you I knew I'd face God and have to account for my sins, as you will. I knew it. Nobody had to tell me that. But how to get around those sins was an entirely different proposition. Well, I went, went on keeping on with the vacation and the business. Got to Denver. It was March of 1925. I was beginning to feel awfully bad. I'd walk at night the dark streets until sweat poured off me, until I could hardly pick up one leg and to follow the other in order to get tired enough to go to sleep. I tried one more sleeplessness. Finally, I decided if I were going to get sick, I'd better go home and my parents take care of me. So I asked the YMCA secretary, I found out it held meetings that a man named Durrett for a doctor. I told him I didn't have tuberculosis, that's the first thing to think about in Denver. He asked me some questions, he pointed across the street, 
Central Christian Church. I said, yes, sir. He said, that's my church. He said, you go in through that door. There's my pastor's study. We have a half dozen of the best doctors in town in the church. All right. So I walked in through that pastor's door, up some steps. He must have called the preacher. Dr. James Davis was waiting for me. He took me into his study. We introduced ourselves. I told him what I needed. He said, tell me something about yourself. And he asked me questions about what I knew, what I believed about the Bible, what my parents believed, what kind of a Jew I was, how much I believed in prayer, and on and on and on. And then when I got all through, when he got all through asking me questions, he said, you don't need a doctor, you need Jesus. I got so mad that to this day I can feel the prickly heat. I'm not lying to you. I was torn up anyway. Here I was asking a man for a doctor. I started standing up saying, I'm a Jew. I told you, you're not going to shove that Jesus down my throat. If you can't take me to a doctor, I can still read. I'll take the yellow pages of a, of a almost said New Testament, of a telephone directory and find me a doctor. He's, he put his hands on my lap like this so that he pressed me down. I could have forced him up, but that would have been unkind. So I subsided. He saw he wasn't, I wasn't going to leave, and he stopped talking. If he had talked to me, he'd have never won me. I was steeled, stiffened against him. I was mean mad. He was taking advantage of me, because I was one feeling good. But he reached for a windowsill and got a hold, I remember very distinctly, one of those little square-looking cloth-bound black Bibles. He turned his chair around to it sat side by side, and he opened the Bible. I don't know where. I didn't know the Bible then. And he read, I suppose, from the Old Testament, maybe from the New. He read, had me read, didn't ask any questions, and he told me the story of Jesus. Now, I knew the story of Jesus, but not like that, just in spots. And with the background of Orthodox Jew, I was trained against Jesus. But he kept on telling the story of Jesus. For me to believe that there was a man like Jesus and that he could perform miracles didn't bother me at all. My grandfather used to tell about that rabbi in Lord's Poland who was so tremendous that they didn't even call him by his name. They called him Baal Shem, which means the Lord of the name who was supposed to have healed the sick and raised the dead. Why should my grandfather lie to me? She didn't bother me. He told me step by step by step the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. I get too close to the machine. At any rate, um, when he got all through with just a bad story, he brought me to the cross. All right? The Romans, the Greeks, crucified thousands and tens of thousands of Jews. He told me Jesus died on the cross. All right? He told me they buried him in a grave. All right? Why tell me all that? What do they do with dead people? They bury them? Why get? Then he told me that Jesus arose from the dead. Ah, that have to have proof. He didn't stop. He didn't say, do you believe this? Do you believe that? Do you believe something else? What kept him from asking? I don't know, unless it's the Holy Spirit. If he'd have broken in, he'd have lost me again. And then he went out. I can tell now where he went out, but I couldn't tell then. He told me about the 12 disciples. He called them by their Hebrew names that I knew. I don't mean I knew them, but I knew the Hebrew names. And then he went out. Told me what happened on the day of Pentecost. And called, of all things, I used to teach history, of all things, until then, I did not know 
that any Jews had accepted Christ. I thought it was a pagan, Gentile religion. One more piece of idolatry. But he went on and went on and told me what happened to them, how they died. Told me that the only one who was uh, maybe not killed was John. He didn't call him John, he called him Yohanan. He knew I knew it. He said, now look, son, you might fool one Jew. You might fool 10 Jews, but you're not gonna fool thousands of them on the same thing. He said, you know that the most monotheistic one God people in the world are the Mohammedans. Allah, Ilallah, Muhammad Rasulallah. God is God and Muhammad is his prophet. And next to them, your own people, the Jews. You know that the basic of all your religion is that statement, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Chod, Hear Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And all of a sudden, a group of Jews began to preach that they had seen Jesus after he rose from the dead. I mean, he told it. He told it with a passion. He didn't raise his voice like I do because we were sitting side by side. He told me, he said, you'll never find any peace. You'll never find any rest. There's nothing the matter with you, son. He said, I no people until you find it in Jesus. I started standing up again, saying that I'm afraid I'll always be sick and never find it. Peace. He said, there's just one more thing I can do with you. I said, what is it? He said, will you kneel down and pray with me? I said, Jews don't kneel in prayer except one service a year. He said, one time, but we Jews are. We Jews were and are trained to believe that God answers the prayer of a good person, Jew or Gentile. And maybe it's new to you. And he doesn't answer the prayers of a bad person, Jew or Gentile. I knew it. He was a good man. He dropped to our knees. He put his arm across my shoulder. Bible was on the chair in front of me because I've been holding it. And he started praying. And what do you know? He began to cry. Dear God in heaven. He didn't know me from Adam's off ox. But he began to cry. Maybe I shouldn't have done it. But I sure have thanked God that I did do it. I opened my eyes and looked at him in the tears. Crawling down his cheeks. What did he pray about? 1925. I haven't got that kind of memory. I suppose he prayed for the Lord to open my heart. I'm not going to tell you lies. I don't remember. But the more he prayed, the worse I felt. Not the better. I felt like pushing away his arm and jumping up and running out of the room. I know what that is now because I've seen it so many times in others. The devil was putting up his last fight. When he got all through and wiped his eyes, he said, Now, son, before we get up from our knees, will you accept or receive or let Jesus save you or something like that? I said, Sir, I can't do it. He said, Why not? I said, Sir, you've been honest with me. I'll be honest with you. I've got a father and a mother, four brothers and a sister. If I become a Christian, it will disgrace him. He said, I said, what is right? Something like that. I'm not quoting my exact words. What is right? What do you expect me to do? I've never been in a position like this. He opened the Bible, took it from my chair to his. I'll tell you where he opened it now, because I memorized it right then and there on my knees. Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I said, what does it mean to confess Jesus? He said, may I ask you some questions? Yes, sir. Do you believe, son, that Jesus died for your sins? That God raised him from the dead? I said, sir, do you believe it? He said, with all my heart. I said, what makes you believe it? He said, this book says so. 
I said, I believe it too, because you say so, and the book says so. Look, people, I was a lawyer. I might not have been as smart as Perry Mason, nobody is. But I wasn't as dumb as Berger, nobody is, nobody. But I examined witnesses. I could tell when a man was lying or telling the truth by the way he looked at me or didn't look at me, by the way he repeated himself, and by his ah, oh, and so on. Why should a man lie to me? I said, I believe it too. Somehow I believed it. He said, all right, will you right now confess Jesus? I said, you haven't told me what that means. He said, better still repeat a prayer after me. I said, yes, sir. He closed his eyes, I closed mine. He said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and forgive my sins. I said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and forgive my sins, and nothing happened. Not a thing. He said, say it again. I must have said it ten times at least, and nothing happened. He said, say it again. I wouldn't do it. There wasn't anything happening. Why should I keep on parrot like repeating a <laughs> statement like that, even though it meant something to me? He said, son, you're hanging on to something. I said, no, sir, I'm not, but I knew I was lying. I was hanging on to Papa and Mama and Morris and Harry and Helen and Matt and Issa. I was hanging on to my law partner, Erwin Nobel. I was hanging on to everything a man holds dear. I was hanging on to my profession that I knew I'd lose because most of my clients were Jews. I was just 23. I was scared to death. He said, why don't you let your good God in whom you believe take it over? Just turn it over to him. Turn it over to him. He said, repeat after me. Closed his eyes. I mind. He said, Lord Jesus, come into him. I didn't say it. I started saying it and I broke down. I didn't cry. I didn't weep. I sobbed. I cried and <coughs> sobbed until I was going up and down on my knees. I cried until my head felt as though it were swollen until my chest tormented me. I thought, sure, I was going to die right then and there. I sobbed. I sobbed not because I was feeling good. I'm not going to lie to you because I was scared to death. Finally, when I couldn't cry anymore, how long can a man cry like that? Preacher had his arms around me, had my, me against his shoulder, and he said, now, will you repeat after me? Lord Jesus, I didn't. I controlled myself best I could. And I said something like this. Lord, I don't know. And I don't understand. But this man says, and this book says, that Jesus is the promised Messiah. That he died for my sins. That you raised him from the dead. And then if I ask you to, for his sake, you forgive my sins. I didn't say save me, because I didn't understand the word then. You say, what happened? Did you ever blow up a paper bag, pop it like that? That's all that happened. <sighs> like something had burst on the inside. That's the only feeling I had. Thank you, Lord. You heard me preach. You don't know too much about me. All Jews are emotional, some more than others. And I guess I'm the most emotional of the lot. I'm either way on top or way in the valley, never in between, except occasionally, which is not too often. You see, if I had had, watch what I'm saying. Listen, I'm trying to show you a point. If I had had an emotional experience, I would have never had confidence in my salvation. I would have said emotion, but that's the only feeling I had. Well, that was Tuesday. He baptized me Sunday. I wired home. They wired back saying, come on home, you're still sick. They thought I'd lost my mind. 
Well, I stayed there in Denver. I wish we had a lots of time. I've been tempted to divide it in two until I got a job in a tire warehouse, a paint factory, because, you know, you can't practice law just offhand. I got a telegram from my father that Mama was sick. I took the first train to Chicago, Mama wasn't even home. Papa just wrote uh, that telegram, knowing, knowing that I'd come home. Well, I came, we talked a while. He wanted me to stay there. He got a little angry and hurt. And here's what he told me. He said, when your sides touch each other from hunger, you come crawling to my door. I'll throw you a crust of bread like I would to any other dog. That was his blessing. Couldn't get over it. He did that for a while. I went to, to Philadelphia. Got a job with the Reading Railroad Company. Wouldn't work. I quit my job, bought a ticket to Chicago. I was going to take a last look around, swim out Lake Michigan as far as I could, and commit suicide. I'd ruined my life. I thought I was too proud or too stupid or both to ask anybody for help. I mean, I don't mean financial help, I mean advice, counsel, to pray for me. I didn't understand these things. I was just a brand new Christian. Didn't have a chance to find my feet there. Well, instead of committing suicide, I enlisted in the United States Army. They sent me to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I mean, Walter Reed Hospital in Washington on duty. That's where I met the girl who's now my wife. I was converted in 25, met her in 27. We married in 30. She's a Gentile from Maine. She's a full-time Christian worker, or was until we married, working for the Methodist as a field worker. But I was discharged. I had taken an examination for a medical administrative corps commission and was waiting for my file to come up. When I re-enlisted, they sent me to Station Hospital, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I began holding meetings around Fort Sill. I was preaching in Washington all along. I held a revival in a little community called Woodlawn. And every unsafe person that we knew there, those eight nights, 34 of them, came to Christ. My pastor baptized them. They reorganized the church and called me as pastor, half-time church, every other week. I went to my pastor and said, they want me to be their pastor. He said, sure. I said, and I sold you, yes. I went back and said, all right, I'll be your pastor. After the service, the deacons got around me and said, well, God's going to be our pastor. Well, I'm, for how much should he pay you? Scared, scared me to death. I thought the kind of preaching I was doing, I ought to pay them for letting me preach at them instead of the other way around. I said, I'll tell you next time I come. I went to my own pastor. I said, Brother McClellan, what do you think they want to do? They want to pay me. He said, go ahead and take it. Imagine a Gentile telling a Jew to take it. You know something? You know something? But the Lord works wonders. Well, they paid me $20 every other Sunday, 1930. I'd sign the check, give it back to the treasurer, Liam Penman, for missions. That was in March. In May of that year, I was ordained. I wish I could tell you the agony I went through. My wife and I married in September, went to seminary, was called to a church in Dallas, and then the Texas Baptist Convention called me to be one of its state evangelists. That's how I became an evangelist. And the Lord in his infinite mercy blessed and blessed greatly, established a record across Texas to his glory. Then invitations began to come from all over the world, even as now. I told you about three of them. And I have right now invitations to 30 from 37 foreign countries. If you count Canada and Mexico, it's 39 foreign countries. Pray that the Lord may provide the means. 
Well, I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't want to be an evangelist. And the Lord pushed me into all of them. And I've been going around the world now since 1934 preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. My father was taken to the hospital. My brother in Chicago called me, told me about him. I said, I'm taking the first plane there, meet me. He said, no, it's all right, I'll call you. It's a minor operation. Didn't call me that day, didn't call me the next. Finally, I hunted him down at, at uh, Michael Reese Hospital. I said, why didn't you call me? He said, Papa's gone. I said, when are you going to have his funeral? He told me, Thursday. I said, I'll be there. He said, I'm in your room. Mama's in shock. And if she sees you, you'll kill her. Well, I called the undertaker. He knew my family knew me. He said, Hyman, if you depend on me, I'd like to have you here. Or maybe Harry's right. Besides, you can't do your daddy any more good. So I stayed away. A few years later, Mama died. I told you, here in Los Angeles, my brother here called me. He said, you're taking her home, aren't you? From there, I heard my father, yes. I said, I'll be there. My brother took me off the train, went to his home. After a while, it was time to go to the undertakers. I wish I could describe it to you. That small chapel filled with people, a few Gentiles, mostly Jews. Two reeds of flowers. My kind of Jews don't send flowers to give money to charity. I think that's a better idea than flowers, if you ask me. Then the rabbi stood up and the ancient Hebrew liturgy that most of us didn't understand too well, telling what a wonderful person Mama was. Everybody walked past. We children stood there holding hands, looking down at Mama. And then they walked out. I said to the undertaker, Ralph, give me Mama for five minutes alone, please. You know my story? He said, all right. He said, I will the, tell the Paul Bears to go outside. I will the coffin into the hall by my office. Marjorie and I go in the office. Take your time. I stood there looking down at Mama. She was about five feet one, had beautiful white hair, tiny face, tiny hands, tiny limbs. I bent down and kissed her hair and kissed her forehead and kissed her hands and I said, Mama, I wish it were different. Where is my father? Where is my mother? The baby brother is an enemy. You say, preacher, so far you've told us a sad story. What did you get from it? Don't get me started. Or you'll be here till a week from Sunday night. What did I get for it? My sins are forgiven. My sins are gone, gone, wiped out, covered over, cast behind God's back, buried in the bottom of the sea. My sins are gone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. My sins are gone. I can commit a sin now as I do too often and drop to my knees and weep out my lament of, of repentance and know that the cleansing blood of Jesus washes away my sins again. My sins are gone. I'm a child of God. I'm a, I'm a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm adopted into God's family. My pastor used to say, Hyman, when you have children of your own, you'll be a better preacher. I couldn't understand why having children have to do with preaching. Because every preacher I ever knew had kids had trouble with them. They'd start running around with the deacon's kids and get as mean as 411 different devils. And then my boy came. And my daughter came. <coughs> Listen to me. I hope they never get into trouble. I hope they never get into any wrong. Whatever it is. But I want to tell you something, folks. If my son or my daughter ever get into any kind of trouble, I don't care what the trouble is. I don't care whose fault it is. I'll be in their corner. 
They're my children. What can I do for them? I'm a poor preacher. I haven't got anything. I could have been rich, but I have to spend that money for trips abroad and I have to do it. I'm not the way I am. What can I do for them? I'm a man. I don't have wisdom enough. But I've got me a heavenly father who's got all the treasure in the world. The cattle on 10,000 hills. Banks, all the universe banks don't have the wealth that he contains. Second, he, or third rather, he filled me with the Holy Spirit. He filled me, I walk and I talk with the Lord. I'm never alone. No Christian has a right to be lonely. Think of the days and weeks and months and hours that I spend alone in these motel rooms. Try it someday. But no, I'm not lonely. Because when I get lonely, I stand up and start walking up and down the room, making love to the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And man, I wish I were Pentecostal about that time. <laughs> and just shout and dance the praise of God. Wait, I'm not finished. He gave me, he forgave my sins. He made me a child of God. He gave me the Holy Spirit. He gave me more fathers, more mothers, more brothers, more sisters than any ten white men. Let alone one Jew that are right to have. I've got them in every color, every creed, almost every continent to do anything to help me out. The Lord has taken me up and says when your mother, father forsake you, the Lord will take you up. I'm not finished. Not only did he forgive my sins, save me from hell. Not only did he make me a child of God and fill me with the Spirit. Not only did he give me the assurance, the assurance that he'll walk with me and talk with me. Not only did he give me the love of your friends, but he's given me a job that the angels envy of pointing people to the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. What you think about it, I don't know. But I want to tell you what I know. If the Lord were to call the archangels and the angels together in heaven and say to them, go down on earth and preach the gospel, in five minutes there wouldn't be an angel left in heaven. Just give me that job. And then he's giving me one more thing, if I can tell it to you without crying. He's giving me the assurance of a heavenly home. Won't be long now. I'm not young anymore. Whether Jesus comes first or I go to him first, I don't know. But it doesn't matter. I've got a heavenly home. Listen, I'm done. I've had 40 some odd books published. I can count thousands of sermons in all kinds of languages, magazines, papers. I can count on the fingers of both hands and have fingers to spare the number of times I've preached on heaven. Talk about it all the time. But to take a whole sermon on heaven, somehow I've never been led to do it. But may I say this to you. In 1957, I had a heart attack. They put me in the hospital, told me I'd stay there three months. I stayed there 19 days and wheedled my way out. I've been going at top speed ever since. But you have a heart attack. And you see the cardiogram. And I could read it. I was in the medical department. And the heavy weight in your chest. You quit being brave. You begin to think long thoughts. And since that heart attack, I watched myself a little more. I don't even take care of myself, I don't. Every time I gotta get these glasses a little stronger. Every time there's a new gray hair, there are lots of them. Every time there's another birthday, every time one of my friends crosses Chile, Jordan, I'm thinking more and more and more about him and thanking God of me. 
Amen. He says, what are you crying about? Well, then I'll tell you. I'm a funny kind of a person. When I'm sad, I don't cry. Never. I get into a corner like a hurt pup and leave my wounds. When I'm glad, I cry. I'm glad, people. I'm going home. Going home. No more sleepless nights. No more heartache. No more tears. No more sins. No more Satan. No more hospitals. No more orphanages. No more undertakers. No more graveyards. I'm going home. And the second reason why I'm crying, I want all of you to go with me. I want every man, every woman, every boy, every gutter in this congregation to go with me. And I want to tell you some good news. Every boy, every girl, every man, every woman here tonight can go with me. But there's just one way, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. If I, a circumcised Jew, in covenant relationship with God, Paul, Nicodemus, the rich young ruler, Peter, James, John, the rest of them. If they needed to be born again, how much more do you Gentiles need the Lord Jesus Christ? So I urge you with all my soul as I wept out my heart to hear my testimony that tonight you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. God give you the grace for it. And it will if you ask him to.